everyone. Uh, I see the green light is on. That means that it's loud and clear. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar um, on learning from degrowth to decolonization. This is actually a celebration of the publication of Jamie Tyberg's uh, piece, Degrowth to Decolonization, that was published by the New York office of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone here today. Um, this is a very important piece where Jamie makes a timely intervention into the degrowth conversation through the lens of decolonization. And we're very excited about today's panel. Uh, we're, we're honored to be joined by the, pieces, the piece author, uh, Jamie Tyberg, who's an activist, scholar, intellectual, along with uh, Delfina um, uh, Yohan, and I apologize. Um, and please, I, I will take uh, any correction uh, in terms of the name, uh, apologies in advance, uh, who will be in conversation. She is a local activist in Baltimore, uh, Maryland, and is, uh, is also been active in struggles in Libya, li 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 Liberia. Um, before we kick off the conversation today, um, I'd like to just give an opportunity for the director of the New York office of Rosa Luxemburg stepped on, Andreas Gunter, to, uh, to uh, say a few words of welcome. Um, I'll give it to you, Andreas. Yes, thank you, Kasemba, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm really excited about uh, the presentation of this piece. Uh, usually, we would have uh, the presentation at the beginning, so that we would meet here in the evening in our office and uh, see here and see uh, uh, the panelists, and after that, the uh, piece would be uh, officially provided and. Uh, now it's a bit difficult, different um, because uh, of the time, and uh, but it, this gives uh, this gives us the chance to have even more people in and joining us without coming to New York, without coming to our office, and um, and uh, the second difference is that the piece is already out and uh, we already received a lot of uh, very good, very uh, positive feedback. It was uh, praised by in articles. Uh, it was translated and quoted uh, several times and we are very happy about it. Also the download numbers uh, show us that we had enough with that and that makes me personally very happy and it makes all of the members of the team uh, glad and um, it's also important because uh, this piece uh, connects two of the important fields of work of our office. One is the work on questions of climate change and social ecological transformation uh, which is connected with the debate about the growth. And the other point is the, uh, is the uh, work on racial justice, which is of course connected to the question of decolonization and connecting those uh, two fields of our work uh, and doing that in such, such successful way um, is uh, really uh, an exciting opportunity for us. Um, now, without further ado, I would like the, to, to leave the floor to, to our uh, panelists, and I'm really, really uh, curious to hear uh, the, the uh, conversation between uh, you and uh, how you would and, and how you present this text that is, was published by Ursula Luxemburg Stiftung New York office. And I hand it over to our moderator today, Kasemba, please. Thank you so much, Andreas. And we're very excited about the conversation today. And um, I guess I'll start with Jamie. Uh, Jamie, you know, we talked a couple of days ago and I told you um, halfway that um, this was one of the first times I actually saw the word degrowth. Um, in, a, in, a, in a published text, and I was like, and you were very happy to say that uh, uh, that I, I was, I, I was uh, your, your gateway drug to degrowth, so to speak. <laughs> um, um, 
But um, I just I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, why degrowth? Uh, why why this concept and why now? Hi everyone, can you hear me well? Absolutely. Okay. Um, Yes, so I mean, I don't know how many people in the audience um, got the chance to actually read the piece, um, but in it, I chronicled my like, introduction and journey into degrowth a little bit. Um, I was first introduced to the concept um, in 2017 when I was like very, very heavily involved in climate organizing here in New York. And a lot of the spaces that I was engaging with, um, a lot of the climate spaces um, were really white and really Western and also were not uh, like critically engaging with um, imperialism and like resource extraction and a lot of the conversation around solutions to climate change here in the empire um, just assumed that this like level of exploitation would continue um, and no one seemed to be questioning that really until I read about degrowth um, and then I spent the next year just sort of you know studying it a bit um, learning more about it reading a lot of the texts um, which then made me I guess co first come up with the thesis for this piece which was to like really expand what constitutes as degrowth literature. Um, a lot of what I was reading in conjunction with degrowth texts at the time was, well, one, I was um, reading Lenin's Imperialism. I was also reading Care Work, a um, book around disability justice organizing. Um, and I, I just, I saw degrowth or degrowth principles in a lot of what I was reading, um, but the word degrowth wasn't necessarily used. Um, and I thought, you know, there's so much out there, um, especially things that are not written by Westerners, things that are not written by white people um, that can really inform political strategy and can really influence how degrowth is applied. Um, and so I wanted to highlight that a bit. And then in that, I really wanted to resituate degrowth um, as a tactic within the larger strategy of decolonization. So looking at degrowth, not as the end goal, but the means to which we get to our end goal, um, which is a decolonized world um, evolution. In the same way that I would think of like divestment as a tactic for the larger strategy um, of abolition. Um, because I felt that in a lot of the, the degrowth literature and degrowth dialogue, um, it just viewed degrowth or the, the process of materially degrowing our resource consumption and production as the end goal, as opposed to how we get to a better world. Um, so yeah, degrowth really helped me um, or gave me the language for a lot of what I was thinking um, and provided a framework um, to articulate what I was experiencing, not only like in real life organizing spaces and what was lacking in those spaces, but in what I was reading too. And I'll stop there. Wonderful. And I mean, I think when you read the piece, I mean, it's like a, as a cornucopia, I mean, like a, we have a encyclopedia of different uh, figures. I mean, you mentioned uh, there's Octavia Butler, there's Sylvia Winter, there's, uh, there's uh, the number of black feminist uh, uh, um, uh, scholars and activists who are, who are, who are, some of whom I've never heard of before, um, who you center in the work. And certainly, I mean, I think that you know, we call it, I think that, you know, you know, it's, it's an article, but as much as it's an article, it's an intervention, right? It's a, it's a, it's a reversal of history. And I think that in some ways, um, thinking about like degrowth is also a way of looking backwards, right? Um, and looking at history, right? And we, and kind of, we, we, we figuring history in some ways, right? Um, I know, um, I know there's been some, um, some, um, I know there's been some, um, some, some discussions 
around degrowth um, in relationship between the global north and the global south. Um, specifically around this issue around in the global north, there's an issue around the Green New Deal, there's an issue around, you know, um, you know, um, the, the ways in which, um, uh, 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 you know, green is seen as a, as a, as a pusher towards uh, um, more abundance and, and, and more. And there's, and there's been some sort of like criticism uh, launched against degrowth, um, you know, in this global south, as well as the global north. And I was wondering if we could just talk a little bit about like some of the responses to some of those criticisms, specifically around like the idea around degrowth and like how it relates to the global south and the global north um, context. Yeah, I mean, I think the number one criticism that degrowth gets is um, like a misunderstanding of degrowth as austerity. Um, I think the idea of degrowing our energy consumption really scares people in the global north, um, which is understandable because, you know, immediately they jump to conclusions and think that this means, um, you know, they can't have all their luxury, um, they won't have, you know, wealth. Um, but really, for degrowth, the first question is, like, how do we define prosperity currently in our society? Um, and I mean, I always come back to the Angela Davis quote where she asks, you know, if you have freedom, but you're starving, like, what does that ultimately mean? Um, and I guess for me, I really wanted the article to show that I was speaking to a global North um, audience. Um, in it, I define settlers as well as arrivants, um, which describes, you know, people who have um, been displaced from their home um, and find themselves in the empire due to the actions of the empire. Um, it's degrowing is really our responsibility. Um, I mean, Sylvia Winter, as I allude to in the paper, does say that, you know, a lot of the carbon emissions um, starting from the 1960s are coming from a lot of the newly independent, um, formerly like developing countries, but it's only because there is this global system of capitalism that they are forced to succumb to and forced to rise up to the levels of extraction that the you know global north has um set um and so really i'm not speaking to the global south um i don't it's not my place to tell them like how to organize their society or how to meet climate need um climate goals or whatnot i mean it's abundantly clear who is responsible and who needs to act first um so i would I mean, I think a lot of the people who criticize degrowth aren't really understanding it and are committed to, and some are paid to misunderstand it and misinterpret it. Um, and as for everything, I think our job as people who um, believe in degrowth or want to advance a degrowth society, an abolitionist society, um, an eco-socialist society, it's not really, those people are not our audiences. We really don't have to convince them of anything because there are so many more of us who already understand the concepts and have been practicing the principles who may just lack the language for it. Um, I think it's those people that are our audiences, that are our people that we should organize um, and we should struggle with and not the very few who are, again, like probably paid um, to um, disseminate like misinformation and to try to get people to be scared of and against um, concepts like degrowth that radically transform our society because it threatens them and their interests. I don't know if that really answered the question. <laughs> no, I think it, I think it does. I mean, um... I mean, I think one thing that I mean we talked about earlier this week is that I mean this concept of degrowth is like it's something that you know you're actually organizing around, and it's actually a, a POC uh, degrowth group that's coming about. But before we get into that, maybe we want to bring Philomena. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, um, I'm sorry. I'm gonna. It's okay, it's Bufina. Bufina, <laughs> the conversation. Apologies, my dear dear sister. 
Thank you so much. And I'm wondering, um, you know, uh, you know, based on what you listen to, but also your own experiences around the growth, how does that show up in terms of your organizing work and your, your thought practices on the day to day um, in the future to future? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Jamie is just so brilliant. I love listening to her talk, but um, you know, I came to degrowth in a, a different path. So um, in terms of outside of being an organizer, um, one of the only other, outside of abolition, one of the only other political identifiers that I take on is womanism. Um, and so a part of womanness, if you look within the definition, um, not only looking at the everyday experiences of black women um, in terms of the social, political, economic, but also a huge part of um, womanism and its praxis, it's understanding our relationship with the earth, um, specifically black folks, right? Um, and not only do we have to be well in terms of our bodies, but we have to make sure that we're in sync with the earth. And so understanding that deep growth, um, while for a lot of people is new terminology and new language, that the concept of deep growth is very much so indigenous to indigenous peoples and people of color, right? Um, and the basis of it, if we really want to simplify um, deep growth is living in honor with earth. That is, that is really what it is simplified is how we honor and how we revere the life around us and understanding this as humans, we're not the only occupants of this land, but also that it's a mutual relationship, right? Like I need the earth as much as the earth need me. Um, and so whatever interaction that we're having with the earth has to be from a, a place of sustainability um, and a place from life giving because without it, we have nothing. Um, and so, and then on top of that, uh, I am Liberian and have that immigrant identity and seeing so much of what a lot of the issues we don't talk about when it comes to imperialism <laughs> is very much so what is covered in degrowth, right? And which is what Jamie talked about. Uh, we can talk about climate and environmental justice and not talk about imperialism and the role of the empire of the US um, in that. Um, and so I think for me, it has always been that I, I texted Jamie, I was like the concept of Sankofa, which is, um, a West African Indian Christ symbol meaning go back and get it. Of uh, degrowth is how we lived before. We lived um, and honored the earth before, and we simply need to go back um, to that. Um, so that's kind of my relationship um, to this this topic of degrowth, and, and I hope that made sense. It makes perfect sense. I mean, if I can just intervene, I mean, I mean. I'm coming back from Charleston, um, South Carolina. That's where my people are from. Um, I, I, I salute you for my, for my, my West African, Guinea, Nisambian, uh, rice growing family that's, uh, that settled in South Carolina to, to grow rice and indigo. And, you know, and, and, and I think one of the things that, that really strikes me is that, um, you know, when we're talking about, um, uh, you know, people still have a relationship to land, you know, saying down there in the South. You know, saying like the land is important. Is land is like crucial in terms of like our survival and our and our, and our sense of being as as human beings. You know, saying our our personhood is connected to the land, and I think that also, you know, bringing that bringing that back to uh, the connections, um, the destruction of the land is also like is like a linchpin to so many other parts of. What we're facing. So in Charleston, for example, um, you know, when I was growing up, when I was seeing my aunties and uncles, you know, 80% of Charleston was black. You know, what I'm saying now, like they pushed a lot of the black folks out of Charleston into North Charleston, and what happens? North Charleston now has the highest number of eviction rates in the country, right? But what's also happening in Charleston itself? Charleston is sinking, right? The sea, you know, saying the the sea islands are sinking, you know, the, the, the traditional places where, you know, indigenous um, African uh, people and indigenous people who are settled, who are there, who work the land, who showed autonomy, are like victims of climate change, right? So then the question then becomes like, what do you do about it? Do you go back to like having more cars, more things like that? Or do you have a more, do you try to figure out what the relationship to the earth is, right? And so I think that that's something where, um, 
uh, you know, some people who are doing alternative terrorism, some people are doing like work around like, you know, we figuring out our history or trying to figure out how to use that history as a way of like, you think about land, but also around food, right? And other things, the ways that we can like, kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of go into it. And I'm wondering, maybe flipping that back to Jamie a little bit, like, how are you seeing this in terms of like an organizing uh, practice? And I should say that we, I think we're going to have time for questions as well. But maybe this is the last question. Maybe this time thing too. Maybe put both you and Jamie um, to kind of think through. Like I think that at this point right now, in the age of COVID nineteen, in the age of a, of a, of a unique crisis, um, I think what your article does and what I really loved about it, it produces a, a different type of vision, right? Um, it gets us away from our screens and into the horizon. And I'm just wondering, like, how, what, does that, what does that have you, what does that, what, where, that has, where has that led the both of you in terms of your practice, in terms of like how you in, in integrate degrowth on a day to day? Um, I can start. I think just researching more about degrowth and also um, learning with and from other people who are um, interested in degrowth, I'm, see more clearly what is missing in our movements. Um, and if we are to think of degrowth in three approaches, um, one being economic degrowth, which is like degrowing the economy, making less stuff, producing less stuff, working less. And then there's material degrowth, which is um, you know, just understanding what we're taking from the earth and um, regenerating that. And then the third approach would be cultural degrowth, which would be really like rewriting how we interact with one another, human and non-human. And for me, I feel like that third piece, the piece of care, the piece of cultural degrowth is where we are lacking the most. Um, and that's also why I wanted to bring Delfina into this conversation because, you know, that piece about degrowing is really about healing and transformative justice. And we lack so much when it comes to um, like accessing institutions of care and restoration um, and healing that, and at the same time, like that care piece is I think most critical to achieving the other pieces of degrowth, whether it's like refraining oneself from pursuing all that can be pursued um, at the expense of the earth. Like if you don't care about others and the earth, like you're never gonna be able to limit yourself. Um, and if you don't care about, you know, others, then you're not gonna, you know, save or preserve the earth um, in a good condition for future generations, for people you don't even know. Um, and our society currently, I feel like, especially in our movements, um, really lacks that first piece of care and giving care and receiving care and expressing care and expressing when there's been a lack of care or insufficient care. Um, yeah, I'm really starting to realize like how much of that piece is missing and how much of the work of like abolitionists and disability justice organizers um, can influence that piece. Um, so I don't even remember what the question was anymore, but going forward, like that's what I wanna do more, you know, um, like learn from and like be in those spaces more where we can really learn how we care for one another. Um, hence Delfina's presence. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think um, going back to what Jamie was saying, in order for us to practice that sense of refraining ourselves, um, there has to be, so I'm a restorative practices specialist, and when in doing circle work, one of the things we always talk about um, is that, you know, one member of the community is not well, the entire community is not well. Um, and that level of not just reciprocity, but every decision that is made within the community, whether it is a good or bad decision is going to have an impact on everyone in the community. And so therefore, if we have this understanding of community and the impact of our actions, 
um, we're less likely to engage in harmful actions because we know that we're not the only person that's going to suffer from that. And so that process of self-restraint is really something um, that has been impacted by capitalism, right? And, the, and that if we can access it, we should access it. If we can buy it and if we have enough of it, we should just go ahead and throw it everywhere we can. Um, so I'm gonna actually uh, read um, this. Um, it's from Sweetgrass, uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. Uh, and in it, it talks a lot about indigenous practices and understand, ooh, my eyebrows look really nice, y'all. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, don't be making me feel bad now. Don't be making me feel bad. <laughs> I'm sorry, okay, the Leo okay, in my talk. You, you, in my you, 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 you. I'm sorry. Yo, oh, my Mars. What'd you say, Ken? You, you're on mute. Unmute yourself. I said, I said, don't be making me feel bad because my eyebrows be looking like this, but. Listen, you know. <laughs> my Mars is in Leo, y'all. Blame the Leo. I just got distracted by my own seal. Okay. <laughs> Okay, let me get back to focus. Okay. So, <laughs> but <That's> in, braiding, <laughs> in braiding suit grass, um, they share something called the way for an honorable harvest and the ways in which that um, the values we should have day to day, right? Because degrowth is not just a matter of political, it's a matter of personal too. Everything that we do is an action of that. So it says, um, know the ways of the ones who take care of you so that you may take care of them. Introduce yourself, be accountable as the one who comes asking for life. Ask permission before taken, abide by the answer. Never take the first, never take the last. Take only what you need, take only that which is given. Never take more than half, leave some for others. Harvest in a way that minimizes harm. Use it respectfully, never waste what you have taken. Share, give thanks for what you have been given. Give a gift in reciprocity for what you have taken. Sustain the ones who sustain you and the earth will last forever. Um, it's such a beautiful, I just I actually have this up in my bathroom, but when I was in um, New Mexico for a little bit and I got to be um, on indigenous land, we learned um, for a few weeks, we learned how to properly pick um, from the earth, right? And it was something I had never been intentional even in thinking about just, I mean, if you pick the way that we learn from the elders, even if you pick a leaf, you have to give something back. And so I remember during my time with the Tohono O'odham people on sovereign land, the time that we were there, every step that we took was intentional because we had to look right i had never considered what am i stepping on am i stepping on a plant and I, am i stepping on an animal i live in baltimore city that is not the thoughts that's going through my head when i'm walking so now when i'm on sovereign land and they're literally telling you you cannot just step in your way as if you're not sharing this land we had to always look down and make sure that we weren't stepping on plants and so forth and and so when we would go and i remember we picked some mountain sage um and some greasewood we always had to give tobacco back and we had to go back and do a whole process of thanking the earth and that intentionality and processing of that completely shifted my own understanding because one it took away that selfishness but also i had never considered how conditioned i was within capitalism um and and you know the ways in which that we, especially within the West, um, outside of indigenous cultures, because I'm I was born in Liberia, um, but we're so wasteful um, without any any care. Actually, like it was it was mind blowing to me the amount of things I was stepping on until an elder came behind me and picked each one up and showed it to me, and it was like, look, you stepped on a leaf, you stepped on this plant, you stepped on this bug, and I'm like, oh girl what um and so i think that every day that everyday living of if we believe in transformative justice and we believe um in the importance of every member of our community why would we not see the same significance for the earth when we're in community with the earth like humans are just wild honestly well not just humans because if we really being honest american military in the west has started all of this shit but that's a whole nother conversation jamie <laughs> Yeah, no, that was perfect. Um, 
I'm glad you shared that experience because I loved hearing from it and talking with you about it. Um, Kaz, do we go to questions? Um, but yeah, I think we can go to questions now. Um, but, but maybe just before I go to questions, I just want to say, this one should have say, Jim, just a little bit about this degrowth PLC network that you're working on. Um, you know, that, you know, we mentioned over the weekend and I think you had a meeting or some sort, but maybe we can talk about this a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so this, I ended up co-founding a club for non-white people interested in learning about degrowth. Um, it all came out of one tweet. I was just sitting at home one day thinking like, wow, I wonder how many uh, people of color there are out there who either know about degrowth or want to learn about degrowth. So as we are all um, likely to do, I went, took it to Twitter and I sent out a tweet simply that saying, um, you know, like this tweet if you're not white and you are interested in degrowth or you identify as a degrowther. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I was expecting like maybe a hundred likes, like less than that, and it got over 600. So then I was like, okay, maybe there's a need for some sort of space. Um, and this was all during quarantine and a lot of the people liking it weren't even, you know, based in the United States. So it was obviously going to be an online space. Um, and it's, I recruited two of my friends, Erica and Roshan, um, to help me organize it. And this past weekend on Saturday, we had our inaugural training on degrowth. Um, very basic, um, went over, you know, the origin of the climate crisis and the inception of the growth ideology. Um, we also debunked some of the liberal, neoliberal solutions to climate change, like green growth and eco-modernism. Um, and then we introduced the concept of degrowth and over a hundred people came um, to spend their Saturday with us, which was really exciting. Um, we were like taking bets on how many people were going to join and we were saying like 40 or 50 and then over 100 people ended up coming um, and it's really exciting. Um, my hope is to really just develop um, more leaders within the degrowth community um, who are not white, who are not Western, um, who may be located outside of the United States um, so that more of us can be in these conversations. Um, and that there's less, you know, white academics writing books on degrowth and more of us organizing and applying and practicing degrowth and sharing that um, to inform political strategy. I think what's important too, Jamie, is like the, because something I had honestly never heard of the term degrowth until I actually read Jamie's paper. And when I did, I realized, oh shit, this how, I've been living, right? And there's a um, something that's always important to consider too is like the politics of naming um, as well because what often tends to happen within this colonized mindset um, is that when a people doesn't have a terminology for a thing that they engage in, that that thing has no significance or no legitimacy any longer. Um, and that somehow we're waiting for white climate justice folks to whisk us away and show us the way when quite frankly, our entire lifestyle and the way that um, we have always lived has been within this framework. Um, and taking it again to um, understanding like the racial aspects of degrowth too, because once again, like I said, when Jamie, when I read the paper um, at the time, I don't know if you remember Jamie, but I was reading this book, Bell Hooks, Belonging, A Culture of Place. And in this book, Bell Hooks talks about, she's originally from Kentucky, and she talks about her journey back home. And within her journey back home, she also um, does a lot of work around naming the relationship of Black people to the earth, right? So I'm going to read like um, three things that stuck out from there. So the first thing she says is, when we love the earth, we're able to love ourselves more fully. I believe this, the ancestors taught me it was so. So once again, laying this claim specifically within Black culture, um, our existence and our harmony with the earth and the fact that um, the love that we have for the earth is a reflection of the love that we have for ourselves, right? Um, I always want to find ways, like I said, to make it personal, 
so that people can take out the big, um, sometimes intimidating things that come with their terminology and really see it when we strip it apart, that this is already um, part of our identity and how, who we are. And then she says, living close to nature, Black folks were able to cultivate a spirit of wonder and reverence for life growing food to sustain life and flowers to please the soul, they were able to make a connection with the earth that was ongoing and life affirming. And what's important for me within that quote is towards the end where she says, make a connection with the earth that was ongoing and life affirming, which is that every interaction that we're making with the earth, we should be leaving it with its ability to keep it going, right? And once again, the essence of, of degrowth is yes, the earth has the capacity for resiliency and the earth has the capacity to give us more, but it doesn't mean that we should just be running all nil willy nilly taking it all and not giving anything back. And so we have to also question our understanding of what resiliency actually means. Um, because while I think that we can talk about the fact that the earth will always be here, we not, right? So a lot of times when we talk about climate and environmental justice and people are like, but the earth is gonna die. No, baby, you finna die, not the, not the earth. So you should actually, we wanna talk about degrowth and, and pure logic outside of politics. Like logically, you might wanna kind of go this way because is your life, right? And so thinking about how every time we interact that we're making sure that we're, we're participating in a life-affirming interaction, which is the core basis of circle keeping, which circle keep, pe keeping comes from people of color, right? When we sit within a circle, that everything that we do when we move out of that circle space, that connection that we have created is going to be affirming and ongoing even when we're not together in circle. And then the last quote that I'll share, she says, Black people were first and foremost a people of the earth. Um, we even think about like okra. I, I don't know about y'all, but I love okra. And okra is not indigenous to the US. We brought, Black people brought it here. And, and the process of, of sustaining that, um, that folks have to do. Um, and while I think Black people have a very violent relationship with the land in terms of the US, um, at the same time, there's this complicated thing because we cultivated this land. We are the, re you know, outside of indigenous Native American people who were the beginners and keepers of this land. And then we came in and brought our own understanding and combined that together. And so I think without the, the, the personal as well, like the politics of land and black folks is interconnected always. Um, and there's a reason why Fannie Lou Hammer went as hard as she did to make sure that we had our own farm and that we had our own lands and that as much as she was doing a lot of organizing around voting, she would, the next day she was out there in the farm teaching us how to grow. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure to share that to ground it in a more personal. I love when you shared passages. It's my favorite thing. Literally, I was looking at your face the whole time. <laughs> I'm like, how is it always so relevant? Listen, oh, I learned the best from the best. Look at us over here, just a, just a, ooh, ooh. <laughs> I think Kaz's video is cutting out, but we have a question from Patrick in the audience that I'm going to promote Patrick to allow him to ask it for you all. Um, so let me see. Hi, Patrick, Hi. can you hear us? Great. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear Patrick. Okay, wonderful. Um, first of all, just thank you um, so much. This is an absolutely necessary um, uh, intervention in the conversation, um, and it's really sparking a lot that I hadn't thought about before. One of the things that I'm thinking about is, um, you know, from the perspective of like, capital and foreign direct investment and what have you, if US movements around degrowth are successful, um, it means refocusing, like, it means refocusing struggle against capital to emerging economies, um, emerging capitalist economies um, worldwide. And so given that dynamic, um, I'm wondering if there are specific struggles that you want to shout out that you think US organizers need to become more familiar with. And I also just want to frame the like 
I recognize this is an extremely US focused question. Um, but Jamie, given that this was sort of more the focus of your essay, it felt appropriate to frame it that way. Um, I love you all and I'm so excited for this conversation. So thank you again. Do you want to answer it first? I'm trying to rem remember. Um, Rick. Oh, you say you're trying to remember your reference? Yeah, there's something I want to share that I can't remember right now. You want to start and then you jump in? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think for me, I always go back um, to Thomas Sankara. I think that he's a great example. Um, so if people don't know, he was the first president of Burkina Faso. Um, he was assassinated, of course. Um, and as always, every assassination, the U.S. had a hand in it. Um, but he was very big on sustainability in the earth. Actually, within four years, he planted 10 million trees. Um, and something Thomas and Kara talked a lot about, um, even when talking about deforestation um, and so forth, is he kept saying imperialism is the cause of this, and we have to look at it from that that perspective. Um, not only that, but T Thomas and Kara did not. Um, Jamie talks about in the paper uh the the uh the impact of war um luxury cars um on the environment she talks about it in there and that is something that Th thomas and Carol was very specific about when he came into presidency he sold off every all of the fleet of cars and only used a regular oh i think it was like a honda or a toyota or something which was the most normal car in burkina faso um he did not have ac in his office because he believed that the people did not have access to AC. He rode a bike everywhere that he went. Um, and then he also, before he passed away, he was creating a specific plan that would be able to save most of the forest within um, Burkina Faso um, and neighboring, neighboring countries. And so in reference to what are some um, non-US um, abroad people to look at, I always go to Thomas and Care first because I don't think people consider some of the, a lot of the environmental justice work that has happened with on the continent is often ignored. Um, and so, yes, that would be my first place to start. But I think the, in order to start that too, Patrick, like we said, there has to be an analysis of imperialism because just about every degrowth or any conversation around degrowth that we're going to have in terms of outside of the West is going to be informed by imperialism, if that makes sense. I hope that everything I just said made sense. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, the thing that I was gonna plug that I remember the name of is called the um, Fort Elisa Declaration. It's F-O-R-T-A-L-E-Z-A. -E um, and it's a declaration written in 2014 by um, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa when they met in Brazil. Um, and it's not perfect, like it advocates for a two-state solution on Palestine, um, but it is like a long declaration of how these nations um, intend to build new institutions outside of the World Bank, outside of the um, the International Monetary Fund, um, which as we know, have really like enabled a lot of extractive economies um, to continue. Um, so that's one example I would give, because it's more recent um, and it shows like what these countries are doing that are either like in the periphery or, um, yeah. And then there's also um, the African Continental Free Trade Area um just a free trade area not an agreement but an area um and, and an example of how like different states can like engage and like, contribute to like each other's de growth and development um in a non-exploitative way um, which is how the west does it um, That's my answer. Yeah, that too. Cool. I 
don't see any other questions currently in the chat. Um, if there, we have a few more minutes left. If there's any final things either of you want to plug right now about your work, um, would love to hear it. We can start with you, Bilfina, if you don't mind. Um, hello, <laughs> I didn't even know. Um, okay, so first things first, today's Keith Davis Jr.'s birthday. Happy birthday, Keith Davis Jr. Um, if you aren't familiar with Keith Davis Jr., he was shot at over 40 times here in Baltimore City. Um, and then he was accused of a crime he did not commit. Regardless if he did or not, he should not be imprisoned. Um, and so today's birthday, we have been fighting for five years for his freedom. So any social media, if you look up free Keith Davis Jr., um, you'll be able to find information on him. And if you're feeling, you know, generous, if you could donate commissary, being in prison, most people think it's cheap. It's not. It's very expensive, actually. Imprisoned people pay far more for necessities than we do on the outside. And so um, say happy birthday to Keith. That's my little plug for the day. Jamie? Um, my plug is like always the same. Um, well, it's New York specific, but you know, follow Free Them All 2020, follow um, Survived and Punished, um, follow Housing Justice for All, those three campaigns, um, trying to free everyone and house everyone, um, ultimately. And they're both very activity heavy campaigns right now, um, because so much is happening around um, the pandemic, and there's a looming eviction crisis, and, you know, prisons and jails are the hot spots, um, and they will always have something for you to do if you have time and um, the ability. Um, okay, wonderful. Who is talking? As we can. I think I think we're losing Kazembe's connection. Um, unfortunately, it seems to be going in and out. Um, um, so from the Rosa Lux side. Um, there's, um, let me see if Kaz, yeah, Kaz's audio and video is going in and out. There is a People's Hub um, circle, climate justice circle that Rosa Lux is working on. I'm going to put it in the chat um, at a point. And so that is what we are working on as our next webinar. We want to thank Jamie and Delfina and Kazembe for, um, for, Moderating, it's been a um, let's see what's going on. You can, mute, you can mute Kaz if you, yeah, just mute them. There we go. Okay, um, I want to thank you all for joining us today. I'm sorry for these um, technical difficulties we had at the end, but I think it was a really, really profound and fantastic conversation. And want to thank you all. Um, and um, thank Andreas for the intro, Kazembe for moderating, Jamie and Belfina for being on the panel, and we will be posting this on YouTube. We will also be sharing out the links that are circulated in the chat um, with that, and want to thank you all for coming today and um, heed their advice. It was really wonderful. So thank you all very much, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Belfina, plug your Instagram. Not your personal one, but your um, Black Feminism Womanist one. I'll put it in there? Yeah. OK. That, that has all the readings you need. Yeah, that's all the readings. A lot of the readings is over there that we mentioned, too. Wonderful. OK, thank you all so much. And um, we will see you for our next event. Thank okay. you. Bye. I'm going to take you in. <laughs>